Voice introduces Bahamaland, an unlimited nationwide calling plan for only $5 a month. So call on today and connect again with Bahamaland. Home never felt so close. The Cuban ambassador says two Cuban men will get to tell their version of events in alleged abuse hearings. By one way or by other, but they will testify. Anti-vat campaigns intensify, police investigate sexual assault claims on Bimini, plus what's happening with the multi-million dollar critical care block. Those stories and a whole lot more coming up tonight. I'm Vonnie Chude and NB12 starts now. Topping news tonight, months after allegations of abuse at the Carmichael Road Detention Center surfaced, setting off a media firestorm, Cuban ambassador to the Bahamas Ernesto Soberon Guzman insisted today the men at the heart of that controversy would testify one way or another. Guzman says it's important for the two men to tell their side of the story and even suggested it's something that could be examined by an international commission. At the end of the day, you, they will be able to uh, testify in the trial, you know, by one way or by other, but they will testify. A letter has reportedly been sent to the Cuban government requesting that two Cuban men return to the Bahamas. Jordan Cantero and Alexander Vazquez are expected to provide testimony if given permission to return. Guzman, who was a guest on Guardian Radio talk show Daryl Miller Live today, could not say when the Cuban government would respond, but said Cuban officials are working on it with Bahamian authorities and even suggested an alternative. It could be that they come here. We have the derogatory commission too as uh, an option, so we have different options on the table. Uh, legal uh, procedure, I'm not just familiarized with them because I am an engineer, not uh, a lawyer, but uh, I know that it's an international uh, legal procedure. Attorney Wayne Monroe represents five Marines accused of abusing the detainees during an escaped attempt last May. He said in the event the men are not permitted to return, the parties involved in the hearings should travel to Cuba. Either way, the Cuban ambassador says it's important for them to give their version of events. Uh, the most important thing is they, they testified in the trial, you know, so and they tell the people, they are version of the story. So I think that the, this is the most important thing. The allegations, which surfaced last year, sparked a series of protests by a group of Miami-based Cubans and even led to new procedures which reduce the length of time Cuban migrants are detained here. Guzman says he's happy with the progress made after that agreement. The things are being working uh, on, uh, properly and uh, I think that we get our objective. That was that uh, those uh, irregular migrants don't spend, doesn't spend too much time here in the Bahamas. So, and that is part of our dialogue around this situation, you know. So this is an issue that you have to approach from a different way, not only from a one way. So you have to resolve a lot of things. And we have been talking about all of those things during the last two, three months. Police on Bimini have launched intense investigations into two separate reports of sexual assault. In the first incident, police said a North Bimini resident reported that several men sexually assaulted her at her home. The men were taken into custody and are being questioned in the matter. In the second incident, a female employee at a resort on the island reported that a male at the resort sexually assaulted her. Police say a man is being questioned in relation to that matter. 
Resorts World Bimini said in a statement last night, it is aware that alleged illegal activities may have occurred involving non-Bimini Bahamian nationals who were contracted as construction workers. The statement reads an incident took place in non-public areas of the resort and no employees or guests of Resorts World Bimini were involved. We are fully cooperating with authorities in the ongoing investigation. We are also assisting authorities with their investigations into another matter involving an alleged sexual assault of Resorts World Bimini employee by a subcontractor staying at the resort. In other crime news, authorities on Grand Bahama making a big drug bust at the Freeport Container Port this morning. Reports are shortly before 8 o'clock, DEU officers and Bahamas and U.S. Customs officers searched a 20-foot container and found 80 packages of cocaine stashed in three black bags hidden in bags of coffee. The drugs weighed about 95 kilos or 209 pounds. Police say the cocaine has a street value of more than $2 million. No arrests have been made up to airtime, but police are still investigating. Equal treatment under the law, responsible taxation, accountability and freedom of information are some of the main tenets of the Coalition for Responsible Taxation and a petition demanding that Bahamians wake up and speak out. The coalition is preparing to ramp up its efforts to make Bahamians more aware of the country's dire fiscal situation and have a say on what is done about it. Christina McNeil has more in this report. Wake up, Bahamas. It's the message of the Coalition for Responsible Taxation, which is urging government to put off the July 1st implementation date of value-added tax. Co-chair of the committee, Robert Myers, says it's something that every Bahamian should be very concerned about. This is absolutely not a political issue. This is a Bahamian issue. This is about, you know, a pivotal tax change, um, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue. Um, it's, it's one that can, will affect us um, for a very long time. And if we don't get it right, it's one that could, um, you know, could, could potentially sink us. The, the whole idea of Wake Up Bahamas is to wake up the consumer and, rec let, and make them <clears throat> recognize and realize that, that this is a consumer tax and it's going to have an impact on their standard of living, their disposable income. And it's, it's, it's them that, that are going to be most effective. The petition found on wakeupbahamas.com encourages Bahamians to demand the facts, to understand how the Bahamas accumulated $5 billion in debt, to demand a delay in VAT implementation, and to demand alternatives to VAT. In signing the petition, people agree that the national debt must be reduced, but that government should delay the implementation to allow members of the public and private sector to make responsible decisions before final determinations are made. The petition calls for a way forward that will be financially viable and sustainable for generations to come. In examining VAT, Meyer says you must not only look at tax reform and fiscal reform, but everything that has led the Bahamas to this point. It's into, and this is sort of segueing into what you were just talking about, it, it absolutely gets into issues of the rule of law. What's happened is over the last 35, 40 years, you've seen a breakdown in the rule of law. People of, of, you know, in the public sector are, are failing to um, enforce the rule of law. So they're not, you know, they're not <clears throat> taking seizing properties back when they don't pay property tax. That has an effect on the budget. They don't, um, you know, they're not, they're not making a decision on web shops. They're not making a decision, you know, the courts are slow. The ease of doing business is slow. Myers says all of these elements are related and VAT will not be the pill that solves all problems. Rather, consumers are being asked to pay a tax to support the government and its expenditure. Through the Wake Up Bahamas initiative, Bahamians are being asked to consider how VAT has impacted other countries in the region, St. Kitts and Nevis in particular. It's just killing poor people. The simple fact is that as soon as VAT went in, lots of prices went up. And I haven't exactly seen them coming down so fast. So the money come, money gone. So the poor people, the poor people have had it more difficult. As a country, let me warn you that you are stepping into the unknown if you are to introduce that. I would say to you, find other means of raising revenue. I personally would like to see that eradicated. Ask us if we like that, everybody will tell you no. I think definitely we would turn it back to a pre-vat. 
Myers says there are still a number of unanswered questions surrounding the implementation of VAT, including the details of the tariff schedule, which will lay out revised customs duties based on value-added tax. He says the coalition would also like to see a dynamic model to detail how VAT will impact the country for years to come. The IDB did some what we would call static modeling um, that, that has some misgivings um, with regards to projections. It looked to historical data and not, uh, not projections. Our primary concern with that is the fact that because of the levels of consumer debt and because of the average wage of, of the consumer, um, we're very concerned that that will have um, a damaging effect on the economy overall. And if it slows the economy or puts us back into a recession, the inevitable is that there'll be layoffs, there'll be cuts. Um, and if the consumer fails, then the businesses will fail also. Up to airtime, the petition had more than 2,000 signatures and it will run to late February. And the momentum is, is definitely catching up. We look at the the number of hits or petitions signed in the first week versus the second week, the second week is double what it was in the first week. So as this thing gets rolling, it, it clearly picks up some momentum. Um, and then we would deliver that petition to the, to the government and to the ministers um, and, and say, you know, listen, you've got X number of people in your, in your constituency um, that, that clearly want to, uh, to look at alternatives. Um, and slow this thing down. The Coalition for Responsible Taxation was founded in October 2013 and its members represent more than 20 major industry associations in the Bahamas, 700 businesses and 60,000 employees. Reporting for NB12, I'm Christina McNeil. If Prime Minister Perry Christie decides to stay on as Progressive Liberal Party leader going into the next general election, two senior PLP members say he would receive widespread support. The decision came after Christie suggested that if former Prime Minister Hewitt Ingram returns to public life, there is no guarantee that Christie would exit. PLP Chairman Bradley Roberts also said he would delay his exit from politics if Ingram returns as leader of the Free National Movement. Roberts said while the PLP has a cadre of new generation leaders, many in the party love and are committed to Christie, who had promised that this term would be his last. Senior party member George Smith said unless a viable contender for the PLP's leadership emerges, it is likely that many in the party will rally behind Christie to stay on. However, FNM Chairman Darren Cash said he does not think Ingram will leave retirement. In other news, construction crews have been working on the multi-million dollar critical care block of Princess Margaret Hospital for three years now. Today, Public Hospitals Authority Chairman Frank Smith revealed only two phases are left in the massive project. Jasmine Bonamy has the latest. After months of construction and millions of dollars in spending, officials are revealing that the critical care block at Princess Margaret Hospital is in its final two stages and is expected to open its doors to patients in the next few months. But Smith said he could not give an exact timeline as to when the facility would be fully operational. Last year, it was revealed that contractors had finished their construction on the building, but the government had yet to receive all the equipment needed for the block's operating theaters and intensive care units. Today, Smith gave an update on progress, saying the last two phases will involve completing the finishing touches. Smith confirmed that not only has equipment arrived, most has already been installed and is ready to be tested. The critical care block is nearing uh, the completion of the construction phase. I'll be meeting weekly, ironing out the finer details so that on day one we're ready to go. Progress reports are given uh, uh, almost on a daily basis uh, where we're at. The facility is expected to cost the government $100 million. The project began in November 2011, and when completed, the 75,000 square foot extension unit will include six surgical suites with state of the art equipment. It will also house a new central sterile department, 18 recovery beds, 20 private ICU rooms, 48 NICU beds, upgraded administrative facilities, and the new main entry into the facility. Smith said while the PHA is also anxious to have the facility completed, 
All checks and balances must be met, as the facility will contain highly specialized elements that must be up to international standards. We're managing every single detail on it so that it will be an experience and of course you know it's critical care. So that's going to mean a lot for uh, saving of lives and um, improving the experience. Of course, you know, you have several checklists, so we are, we are probably in the last uh, two phases of the construction project. And again, all systems have to be complete before you, in one particular phase before you say you're into another phase. In 2013, the government approved a $5 million expenditure to hire support staff for the new block, including nurses and lab technicians. Smith admitted there is a challenge finding enough properly trained staff to man the unit. Reporting for NB12, I'm Jasmine Bonamy.